Well, good morning. Well, that was okay. I'm not even going to try again. But, you know, it's good to see you this morning. It's good to be able to worship with you and uh, what we do here. And I think, you know, as we go through this message here this morning, what we do here on Sunday mornings is so important. And, uh, and so I'm just so glad to be able to worship with you. You know, I, I love camping. I don't know about you guys, but I'm, I'm one of those people who, um, I, I used to do this a lot. I don't do it as much anymore, but when I went camping, what I loved to do was hike off into the woods, you know, and carry one of those big 40-pound packs and just go for days. And uh, I used to do this uh, when I was younger, and I remember uh, I had a friend who said, hey, let's go uh, hiking. And I think this one particular time, we were uh, around Georgian Bay in the Bruce, the Bruce Peninsula and uh, doing some hiking up in there, and it's beautiful country. But, you know, when you're in the moment and you're hiking, I'm one of those guys that sweats a lot, and so, you know, like you're just kind of right in the middle of it and you're, it's hot and you're sweaty and there are bugs. And, and at that particular time, it was raining too. So it was paradise, right? And we were just kind of trudging through and there's trees and trees and trees. And, and, you know, for us, you know, sometimes it's just about pushing ourselves physically. And so you'd be kind of going through and then you'd have to like be carrying this pack, but then you'd also have to be climbing up some little small rock faces and things like that. And, and, but but in, in all of that, I remember one particular time when we were hiking uh, there in the, in the, the uh, Georgian Bay, the Bruce Peninsula kind of area on the Bruce Trail. We were hiking along, and, um, and we were kind of going up, and I remember, you know, it was getting particularly hard, and we weren't talking anymore. You know when it gets that hard, and you're not talking to each other, you're just kind of just pushing and pushing, and you're sweating like crazy, and it's just everything. And, and then as we were coming along, there was this path that kind of veered off to one side. And uh, this path just had a little sign on it, just kind of indicating that you should go that way. Uh, and so, you know, we said, okay, what the heck, let's just kind of go in that direction. So we went off and started going down this extra little path. And all of a sudden, it started to kind of get brighter and brighter and brighter. And then the trees opened up and opened up, and we kind of came out on this rock face. And we were looking out over Georgian Bay, and it was absolutely incredible. In fact, I have a picture here that uh, I can show you. And this is... Um, this is back at a time, this is me when I was probably about 18 years old or so, and, uh, and the picture doesn't do it justice, I know it's not digital, I'm sorry, but what you see there is, is me kind of coming into that open space and just kind of looking out over the incredible expanse that was in front of us. It was one of those wow moments that just makes you stop and it makes you pause and you think, wow, this is incredible. And so this morning, what I want us to do is think about this, but I want us to think a little bit about having this wow moment, because, I, and, and you know, maybe you had this moment, you can think of it when you first saw the stars for the first time, or maybe you had one of those wow moments when you saw a sunset that just kind of blew your mind, and for me, these moments really kind of, especially when they happen in nature, they just kind of bring me back to this idea of how great God truly is. But you know what I find is that as I get older and older, I realize that these wow moments don't come along as often. Because I've kind of seen it before. You know, I've, I, but imagine those moments, you know, when you see it for the very first time. It, there's that, that excitement that kind of like, that just makes you stop and look. Because it's so incredible. And that's what I want us to be thinking about this morning. Because I think we've all had these moments. And, and, and for me, they just kind of bring me back to this idea of God and how incredible he truly is. And, and weeks ago, we actually started into this book of Ephesians. And we called the series The Mystery of Us. Because the writer, uh, Paul, was uncovering the incredible mystery of God's plan, not only for our relationship with God, but also the high goals that God has for us as a church. And, and for, the, for the last few weeks, it's really been kind of foundational. We've been looking at kind of this idea of God's grace and his sovereignty, how incredible God truly is. And so chapter 3, like in a lot of Paul's books, what happens is he kind of moves from from the, um, the kind of the, the theological, kind of the grounding kind of thing. And then in the last half of most of his books, he moves into a much more practical application piece. And so what we see here in chapter 3 is kind of a hinge in this book, and it's starting to move towards, okay, what are the goals that God has for the church? And, and how incredible is the church? He's going to move his attention towards the church. And so what I want us to do this morning is I want us to have one of those wow moments where we just kind of stop and sit back and consider how incredible the church truly is. You see, I believe that the church is the greatest place on earth. It's the greatest place on earth, not because of us, but because of what God is choosing to do through us week after week after week. 
And I love the local church, but it's sad that some Christians have just kind of given up. There are many uh, people who would be so disappointed with how the churches have kind of missed the mark that they just kind of think, you know, it's better for Christians just to kind of start over again. And you may have heard this if you interact with people who, who are, are Christians. They may talk about this idea of kind of deconstructing the church and sort of saying, let's, let's kind of do the church in a new way because well, the way that we're doing is not so great. But I hope that we can come to one of those wow moments and, and just kind of wonder and dream about the place of the church in God's larger plan this morning. Because sometimes I think we can get lost in the trees and we can be trudging along and it's sweaty and hot and all those kinds of things. And, and we, don't, we miss those opportunities to kind of get into the open space and see the bigger picture, see what God has for this church. And so we're going to kind of take this little path this morning and consider the church as Paul does here in the book of Ephesians. And like we've been talking about every week, I want you to take some time uh, when you're at home, get into this book, uh, read it. There's so much there in the book of Ephesians. And uh, many of you have been sending in questions. We appreciate that. We're going to be posting those, the answers to some of those questions or at least some, um, some kind of thoughts about some of those questions uh, this week. Uh, so be watching for that. And if you have more questions, please send them along. But, um, but this is kind of an opportunity for us to kind of dig into a really theological book because Paul wasn't writing the book of Ephesians to correct some kind of a problem like he does in many of the other books. What he was writing about in Ephesians is he's kind of, he's saying, okay, here's, a, here's this, this incredibly diverse uh, city at Ephesus, and he's saying, what I want to do is clarify the truth so you get a box around what, what's really going on about our, in our faith. And so he's trying to clarify that for them, and so he clarifies it for us as well. And so right in the start of this chapter, we're going to be looking at, uh, at uh, Ephesians chapter 3 this morning, and it's on page 1157, I think, in most of those black little Bibles there in front of you. And uh, so you can open those up and kind of follow along, because we'll be kind of, kind of moving right through uh, chapter 3 this morning. But he begins in chapter 3 with this very um, uh, this simple kind of phrase. He says in uh, Ephesians chapter 3, he says, For this reason... I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. And then in many of your translations, there's like a bit of a dash. Or maybe it's like a dot, dot, dot. You see, what's happening here is it's kind of an incomplete sentence because Paul is beginning to describe something. And then all of a sudden, it's like, whoa, attention goes somewhere different. It's like, I, I mean, I have the attention span of, I don't know what, but it's not a lot. And so when I'm kind of doing things every once in a while, it's like a squirrel or something just kind of gets my attention. And I'm off in another direction. And I think that's what's happening with Paul here. He starts out and he says, for this reason, and he's referring back to what we just read in chapter 2, and you can kind of follow that through chapter 2, verse 22. He's talking about this incredible new reality that God is kind of putting out there. And he's, he's, he's talking about this idea that Jews and non-Jews are coming together to form this one church where God is present um, through his Holy Spirit because of Jesus. And so, so he, he starts to kind of talk about for this reason, and then he goes on this tangent. And what we see here is that Paul is talking about the, the mystery that's being uncovered. And we've been talking about this mystery as we've been looking through this passage. And it's important to remember that what he's saying is not that it's anything new. God has always had the idea to include people. It's just the plan through Christ is something that was surprising. And it was something that needed to be uncovered. And so this morning we're coming up to Easter. And it's that time uh, when we celebrate the work of Christ in his death and, and his resurrection but even days before that moment, even days before God's plan was not still fully known. And today is Palm Sunday. And this is the day when we remember Jesus coming into Jerusalem on a donkey. And it was this dramatic scene. And you remember that people were just kind of laying out their cloaks and their waving palm branches. And they're so excited about who Jesus was because of all the th great things that he'd been doing. All the Gospels record this event. And, and if you can kind of keep your finger there in Ephesians, if you want to flip with me back to Luke chapter 19, I'm going to read just a small passage here, um, or you can just kind of listen as I read along here. Starting in verse 37, here's what we read. When it came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory to God in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd, they said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. You see, they were embarrassed. They were, they were kind of getting this idea that the people had it all wrong. And they were saying, you know, this can't be the Messiah because the Messiah is going to come and he's going to, um, he's going to uh, 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 restore peace politically. He's going to come and, and he's going to change the political landscape. And so they're saying, you know, just kind of just tone down 
what the disciples are saying here, Jesus. And in, in verse 40, Paul, uh, Jesus replied, he said, uh, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. You see, what Jesus was saying is what's going on here is way bigger than just a few people waving some palm branches. Because if they're silent, even the rocks, even nature will just cry out because of what's about to happen here. And then in verse 41, it says, as he approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, he wept over it, which is incredible. But then look at verse 42. He said, if, if you, even you, had only known that this day, what would bring you peace? But now it is hidden from your eyes. If you had only known what would bring you peace. You see, even it was just a few days before the crucifixion and God's plan was still a mystery. The idea wasn't hidden. This idea of peace and bringing peace to the nations was not hidden. But the, but the plan was, was beginning to unfold as Jesus came into Jerusalem. And all of a sudden, you know, this is kind of one of those moments where they're, they're sort of coming through the thickness of the trees and sort of breaking through into that open space to, to catch a glimpse of the bigger picture here. And what's happening on Palm Sunday is that this, this, this mystery is beginning to unravel and we're starting to see the incredible plan that God has. See, he didn't just make it possible for his own people to come back to him. What he was doing was opening the doors to humanity. You can see that. Um, so let's flip back to Ephesians in, in, uh, in chapter 3, verse 6. It says, this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles, and by extension, the nations are heirs together with Israel, members together of the body, and sharers together in the promise of Jesus Christ. You see, this is incredible, incredible news. But still, even after the resurrection, even after Jesus had died on the cross and rose again, there needed to be some explanation and understanding of what was happening. And so Paul was one of those people who was able to begin to explain and it says in verse 8, Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. You see, Paul was saying that it was his plan to bring this incredible news to the people. And to make plain to everyone the administration, what he's saying here, administration is really the strategy or the carrying out of this, ministry, of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. But then we come to the key verse, and you can see this in verse 10. Because God is, is, is revealing this understanding and this new plan to Paul, and then what does Paul do with this? He shares it with the church, and then what happens next? Verse 10. It was his intent was, this is God's intent, was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Through the church... You see, what Paul was beginning to, to, to uncover and to expose what it, it was, that the, was the church that was going to help people understand the wisdom of God. In, in other words, this incredibly wise, perfect plan that God had. This plan that included the richness of his grace. And we talked about that over the last couple of weeks. This plan that included a scope that was beyond just the small, narrow uh, political situation. It was wider. He had this plan that was going to open to the whole world. And you can read more about that as you look back at the end of chapter 2. But this mystery was being revealed, and it was the church that was going to make it known. You see, we look back at this ten, at this verse 10, it wasn't just the world that was watching, it's the whole universe. He talks about the heavenly realms, kind of getting this picture of God's manifold wisdom. And that means that it's the seen world, the unseen world. We talked about that a little bit last week. But everything is all coming together with their eyes on the church to see whether God's plan and whether God's message is truthful. And so, so you see the church begins to emerge as this incredible place, the greatest place on earth. It truly is. And so Paul goes on. And this is where I want to focus this morning as he moves on uh, to verse 14. And he says again, for this reason, you can see that. So what he's doing is he says in verse 1, for this reason, I, Paul, and then he gets, whoa, totally off track, and then he comes back and says, for this reason, I, so he's coming back to that original thought, which is returning back to what we just read in, in chapter 2 and all that, and so here he is, he says in verse 14, he opens up with this, this prayer, that's this incredible prayer that I know that many of you have read many times before, and this is where I want us to kind of camp out this morning, but he's continuing his thought, and he's saying, for this reason, and then he moves into this prayer, 
And so um, I, what he does is that as he comes to this understanding of what the church is all about, as he begins to, to unravel this incredible plan that God has, all he can do is just fall to his knees and start praying. So let's look at this prayer this morning, starting in verse 14. Just listen to these words. In fact, you know what? If, you, if you're following along in your Bible, maybe you can just close your eyes and just listen to these words for a moment. He says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Holy Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know that this love that surpasses all knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than ever we could ever ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen? Isn't that incredible? You see, as he ends this in verse 20, he says, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine, according to the power that's within us. I mean, how many times have we read that passage or, or applied it to our lives and thought about what's going on in our lives and saying, if only I just kind of stepped up and began to pray for things that were beyond my own understanding because God can do immeasurably more than ever I could ever ask or imagine. But look at verse 21. He says, to him be the glory. God's going to get glory. Where is he going to get glory? In Christ Jesus. And where else? In the church. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. When was the last time that you prayed for our church? Or when was the last time that you got on your knees that the immensity of what God was doing in the world drove you to your knees to pray for this place and for these people, for our church? Because the church is the greatest place on earth. You see, Paul prays for several key things as he falls to his knees before God, considering the incredible things that God is doing in the world. And he, he prays for several things. And what does he pray for? Because I think as we look at these things, we'll see the things that we can be praying for when it comes to even our own church. So the first thing you see, you can see in verse 16, the first thing he prays for is power to change. Power to change. He says in verse 16, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. You see, Paul prayed that, that not only would we be strengthened with God's power, but we were strengthened so that Christ may dwell in our hearts. You see, what Paul was saying here is uh, that we need the power to allow Jesus to make himself at home in our lives. You know, when I was a kid, there were three rooms in my house, and there were four boys. And so I shared a room for most of my life. And, but what ended up happening, I was the youngest in my family, and, and so as my brothers went off to, to university, I got the chance to kind of move into their rooms. And it was great, except that they weren't my rooms, right? And so I could move in, but I had to kind of live with the paint color. I had to live with the furniture the way that it was set up, because ultimately my brothers might have come back. And so I was kind of in that space, but not really in that space. And then, and then over time, my wife and I, we decided we got married and we moved into an apartment. And an apartment was great because now it was our space, but not really our space, right? So we moved into this apartment and, and you know, you could change a few things, but if you really wanted to make some changes, you'd have to check with the supervisor. You'd have to, you know, kind of do all that to kind of figure out if it was okay. You had to ask permission to make changes in that space. But then my wife and I moved into our own house. And when we moved into our own house, we had the opportunity to change things. And especially as we moved uh, here down into Burlington, we moved into a place and, uh, and it was a great house. And we decided that we were going to make some changes and actually some significant changes. And so we ripped out the kitchen. We ripped out the floor. We pulled off the doors. We pulled down the wallpaper. We put paint over the you know, the, the, the paneling down in the basement, and we just kind of moved in, and we made this place our own. And I think what Paul was saying here is that his prayer is not that you just let Jesus hang out in your space, not that you just kind of 
uh, you know, get him to, well, you know, Jesus, you can hang out here with me, but just ask permission if you want to change anything in my life. You see, what he's saying here is that we need the power to allow Christ to dwell in our lives, to live, to take up space, to make himself at home in our lives. And I think, you know, for us as individuals, we can think about this and, and allow Jesus to just take over and say, okay, God, if you want to just, if you want to move the, the furniture, if you want to pull down the, the old kind of wallpaper, you want to repaint, redecorate, do whatever you need to do. I think sometimes we need to get this idea in our minds that, that we need to allow Jesus to come into our lives and renovate from the inside. But see, here's what's going on. When we look at this passage, he's not just talking about us individually. He's talking about us as a church. And my question to us is, are we going to be the kind of church that actually allows Jesus to rearrange the furniture? Are, are we going to be the kind of church that allows Jesus to make changes so that he can make himself at home right here at Compass Point? You see, when we allow Jesus to move into our church, you know, what we do is we allow him to get right into the core of who we are to begin to change us from the inside out. And, and listen, we all know this, but no church is perfect. No church has made it. None of us have kind of got there, and so there's always room for us to grow. But I want to encourage us this morning that we pray that, that God continues to give us the power and the courage to open closet doors in the church. And You're with me, right? I'm not actually talking about closet doors. I'm saying that, you know, we need to have the courage to be able to open those places that maybe we've been kept, you know, keeping God out of. And we're saying, well, you know, that's just not a really big thing. That's just kind of something that we do on the side. Are we going to be, have the courage to open up every single one of those closets and say, you know what, Jesus, if you need to move in, we want you to move in. <laughs> and we want you to change us. And you, we want you to change us from the inside out. You see, this is the prayer that God would continue to help us you know, just kind of see those places and, and allow Jesus to, to, to make himself at home right here in our church as the foundation of everything that we do. Are we willing to let him move in? You know, if we're going to have an impact in our community, if this church is going to continue to grow and have influence in, in, our, in our community, we will continually need to renovate and allow Christ to be the center of everything that we do. And so Paul says the church would need to have the power to change, but then he moves on and he says that the church, he prays that the church would have the power to know. And look at this in verse, the end of verse 17, he says, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. You see, so really the first step is giving him access and saying, okay, Jesus, yeah, you can come into here and here and everywhere. But the second thing we need to do is deepen our understanding. And, and so what we see here is that the church in Ephesus, th that Paul was praying for these people that they would be firmly planted in God's love. And notice the emphasis in verse 18. He's saying that we would be firmly established and planted together, together with all of the Lord's holy people. So this is something that we need to do together. Because in God's infinite wisdom, he chose the church to make known the incredible plan of God. And so this matters. And so we need to be firmly planted and rooted in his love so that we can comprehend and begin to comprehend how deep his love is for us so that we can begin to display that to people around us. Listen, you know, there are all kinds of things that are important in a church. But if our church is rooted and established in tradition then we cannot show the kind of love that Paul so desperately prays would be evident in the church. You know what happens? We become exclusive. You see, if our church is rooted in rules, what happens is we become harsh. And if our church is rooted just solely in doctrine, then we become cold. But what Paul was saying is that I pray, I pray, I pray, I fall to my knees and pray for this church that you would be rooted and established in love. Because when we understand that love, that begins to, to show the world that our message is truthful. You know, when Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples, you know the story, right? He took off his outer cloak that showed his, his glory and his kingship, and he put on the clothes of a servant, and he got down on his knees, and he washed his disciples' feet. And in that moment, you can see what he says is that, I am showing you a new way to love. I am showing you a way to love that is beyond anything. And you got to know something. The way that you love one another is going to be the way the world knows whether my message is truthful. The way that, that you love each other is going to show how important it is that, that the way that you show each other that love will be a demonstration of the love that God has even for us. 
So are we going to be a church here at Compass Point embracing and reflecting the love of Christ to each other? You know, would you do me a favor? Would you pray that that's what happens here in our church? Would you pray for us that we become a church that is embracing and reflecting that love of Christ? And so Paul prays that the church would have the power to change. He prays that they would have the power to know. And then finally, what he says, in, uh, he says the power to show. You can see this in verse 19. In verse 19, he says, to know this love that surpasses knowledge. What a great phrase, right? <laughs> Good luck with that. To know the love that surpasses knowledge. That you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. What he's saying is it's not just about knowledge. Understanding and getting that deepening understanding is that first step. But we have to go beyond that and begin to show it. And show it. In verse 10, Paul says that the church is going to make known. So how do we do that? You see, there is this... Um, uh, uh, so what he says is, okay, so he says uh, we're demonstrating to the world that God's plan was wise. Let me explain what I mean by that. that. That when a wise plan is one that works in the end, right? If, if, and so what we say here is that the church is exposing it and, and beginning to show the infinite wisdom of God, his wise plan. And so what we do when we interact with each other and when we begin to show others, what we're doing is we're showing that God's wise plan is working. And, and when we go in the opposite direction, we're painting a very different picture. But what he says is that you need to have the power to show, but I want you to be filled to the measure, meaning filled right up to the brim with all of God's goodness. One of the pastors that we used to work with here, actually, was Mike uh, Pawelke, and he's actually coming to speak here in a few weeks. Um, but we used to, he used to love to, um, when, when people would come into the office and ask for a drink of water or coffee or whatever, he used to love to pour it and then keep pouring it right until it was, you know, bubbling over the top of the cup. And he would do that all the time and just kind of, you know, with, without saying a word, just filling it right up. And it was always interesting to see people try to, you know, drink from it or put their head down to the table or whatever it was. Because, they, you know, he's the pastor, right? And so they didn't want to offend him or anything. And, and yet, you know, he was always doing this because, and the, the neat thing is that, you know, when your cup is filled right to the top and you begin to move, what happens? It spills, right? It begins to kind of flow over the edges. And so if I'm standing there and I watch you coming towards me with a cup that's filled to the brim and you start walking, it's spilling over, I can see what's going on inside that cup. I can see that it's filled with whatever it is, coffee or juice or whatever, water. But you know, when the, wa when the cup isn't full and you're walking around with this cup, you can't see what's in it. It's like one of those commercials, you know, when they're drinking something at the end of the commercial and you know there's nothing in the cup, right? Because you can't see what's inside of it. And so what he's saying here is that I don't want you just to have a little bit. I don't want people to be able to say, okay, well, you know, Jesus is in that church somewhere. It's kind of close to the bottom. But if you're standing out here, you wouldn't be able to see it at all. And what he's saying is I want you to be filled to the measure, right up to the very brim with all of God's goodness. And so what happens is when we begin to move as a church into our community and interact with people, it starts spilling over the top and people can clearly see that this church is about recognizing the glory of God and who he is. And so what he says is that this Christ-likeness should be just kind of coming up to the top, flowing over the sides and overflowing, and we need to be continually filling that up. And so each one of us, there's a responsibility for us to be, you know, uh, searching after that Christ-likeness. But as a church, we need to begin to, to be a kind of place that's filled to the measure of the goodness of God and who he is. And, and so the church is the greatest place on earth, we need to pray for that, not just Compass Point, but all of the churches that are here in Burlington. You know, we think of Harvest and the Meeting House and Burlington Alliance and all kinds of other churches I could go on. But would you pray with me that God would be made known by our churches? That, that, what we, that God would provide the power for us to change from the inside out? You know, would you pray with me that our churches would, would have the power to consider and reflect the love of Christ in everything that they do? Would you join with me in praying that, that they would show the world by their actions, that they would demonstrate, that we would demonstrate the love of God? You see, it matters. You know, and I, and I hope that we have this opportunity to kind of come into this space and recognize how incredible what we do really is. This is a wow moment when we show up here on Sundays because we have an opportunity to partner with God in something absolutely incredible. Could you imagine the kind of impact that our church would have on our community, 
and, and all of our churches would have on our community if we were doing this, if we were continuing to, to pray and to get on our knees and to bring our churches before God. You see, as Paul was writing this book of Ephesians and he's beginning to move and shift into the application of what it looks like to live out in the, in the church, what he describes here is, is how important the church truly is. And so this morning, I want us to just be considering that and thinking about that. Um, we are going to actually take a break uh, from Ephesians for the next couple of weeks. But when we come back to Ephesians, what we're going to do is pick up in chapter 4, where Paul begins to really start to, to get practical in helping us understand what it is, that it, what it would look like for us to live up to the high goals that God has for the church. So let's continue to pray for our church and pray for the churches around us that we would be able to make these uh, places great, make these churches opportunities to reflect the incredible love of what God has done in our lives. This is the place that will make him known. There is no higher calling. There is no higher calling at all. And so let me just close by um, going back to that passage that we read and just recognizing that verse 20 that reminds us again that we serve a God who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask for or imagine according to the power that is at work within us. And maybe this morning, what I'd like you to do is to shift this passage that is so fantastic, and it means so much to us personally, and begin to look at how this, this passage applies to our church and the churches in our communities. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Let's pray together. God, you... You are so worthy of our praise. God, we love you for everything that you have done in our lives. We praise you for how incredibly um, loving your act of, uh, of sending your son to the earth was. And God, as we approach this Easter season, I pray that it wouldn't be lost on us of what you did for us. But God, I also pray that we would be able to look around and we would be able to see the people that are around us and smile and recognize that, God, you've placed us together for a work. And, God, the greatest evidence of your power is action and is change. And so, Father, I pray that, God, as you continue to grow us and change us from the inside out, that, God, we would have an influence in this community that would make your name great. God, I pray that we would be uh, just uh, exclaiming from the mountaintops that, that God, you are good and you are a loving God. And so, Father, we thank you for the, the amazing place that you have placed us in as a church. God, that you have given us that opportunity. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us to see the importance of this church and see how we can partner in you in, in accomplishing your purposes in the world. God, we thank you for who you are. We praise you for who you are. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.